So uh, today's topic, inshallah, is the psychology of fasting. First, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Aman Siddiqui. I'm a clinical psychologist. I live here in uh, Maryland. Um, <clears throat> today, we'll have two topics. One is uh, the psychological benefits of fasting to learn a little better how fasting improves our mind and our thought process. And one thing we'll look at in that topic is the quality of our fast. Maybe I'll just wait if everyone could uh, settle down and, and, and uh, remain quiet. We'll, we'll take a break real quick. Okay, great. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'll just start from the beginning. Uh, the psychology of fasting. Topic one is the psychological benefits of fasting. And in that area, we'll look at not just did you fast or you didn't. Often we discuss it as a kind of binary thing. I did my fast. We know that prayers can be better or worse. You can be more focused, less focused, right? But usually we just think of I did the fast or I didn't, the fa didn't do the fast. So we'll look at how the quality of our fast and what that even means can, can increase the benefits we get from it. <clears throat> Second topic is to learn more about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed fasting Ramadan. Um, and this part I wrote for my own self. I need to implement all the things we'll talk about today more than anyone. And so I, I'm writing this to myself and hopefully it will benefit anyone else. But why even we should be, what, why Allah, you know, uh, He gave us these ibadah for a reason. So why is it important for us to fast Ramadan? <clears throat> okay. In 1972, at Stanford University, they did a research project. They took 32 children between the ages of three and a half and five and a half. So average age was four years old. They brought each one into a room individually. And they put a marshmallow on the table in front of them. They said, I'm going to leave the room. If you can wait here 15 minutes without eating the marshmallow, when I come back, I'll give you a second one. Get two marshmallows. You can eat them both then. If you eat them within the 15 minutes, you don't get any other marshmallow. <clears throat> now, this is what's called a study of delayed gratification. They were looking at what type of mechanisms the children would, uh, would utilize to help them get through that test. Uh, delayed gratification, the definition is to forego immediate gratification for the sake of later consequences. That's the definition. So not only did they do this experiment, they followed those children for the next 30 years. They knew which of the children were able to complete the test, and they, and they also wrote down how they were able to. What techniques did they use to make it through? Imagine you're four years old, 15 minutes with a marshmallow is a real fitna. <laughs> how they, not only who passed it, but how they did it. <clears throat> and which ones did it? Which ones just ate it? And said, I can't wait 15 minutes, no way. They followed them for 30 years, and this is what they found out. Those who could wait the 15 minutes, they, over their lifetime, they had greater self-control. They were more successful in their life. They had better grades in school. They were able to cope with frustration and stress better. They had higher self-esteem, and even they had better physical health. All of these things were correlated which, with, with which group you were in. The ones who passed the marshmallow test or the ones who didn't. <clears throat> So why is the ability to delay, delay gratification such a powerful skill that it will impact the whole rest of your life, as this experiment showed? So first of all, delaying gratification is a type of patience. A lot of times um, <clears throat> in my clinical practice, I talk about patience. And people often associate patience with just waiting around or just doing nothing. That's being patient. But actually, the psychological benefit of patience is much more profound. It's whenever 
you have control over your actions as, a, as opposed to your impulses controlling them. So whenever you want to do something, but you shouldn't, you hold yourself back. Or you should do something, but you don't really want to, and you push yourself to do it. So in English, you might call the first one self-restraint. You might call the, the other one <clears throat> like endurance. These are all forms of sabr. So bravery is patience with your fear. You're afraid, but you do something that you should do to help someone. You're brave. Uh, Self-restraint is patience with your desires. Right? You hold yourself back from some negative desire. Um, trust in Allah, tawakkal, is patience with your anxiety and your sadnesses. You have these feelings, which is not in itself bad, but if they were to control your life, right, you say, okay, I have these anxieties, I have these sadnesses, but I will do, I will trust in Allah. So whenever I am acting as opposed to what my impulses are telling me, this is a kind of patience. Qiyam al layl if you pray in the night, this is patience with your laziness. So patience has a lot of implementations. And delayed gratification is one of those forms. <clears throat> okay, so what does the marshmallow test teach us about fasting? Voluntarily abstaining from food and drink builds your ability to restrain yourself from acting on your impulses in general. That's what we learned from the marshmallow test, right? They weren't just able to not eat sweets. They were able to do a lot of things. They were, they were able to deal with stress better in their life. They were, why did they have better grades? Because who likes to study? Not everyone's a big fan of studying, right? But when it came to time to study, and their mind was saying, ah, go watch TV, they were more likely to push forward and study, right? Better physical health. Exercise and fitness is not an easy task. But they were, those, the people who were able to resist the marshmallow test uh, were better able to keep on their exercise regimen. It, it permeated all the aspects of their life. That's the key point. So the ability to just resist, resist food and drink builds a cognitive ability to resist impulses in general because your hunger and your thirst are very strong impulse, right? Um, <clears throat> so if you have built that ability, you might also be able to restrain yourself from yelling when you're angry. You will have more, uh, the more control you have over yourself, instead of your, your impulses, the less control over you, shaitan will have. So this is kind of why Rasulullah um, told people who aren't married, he said, to fast. When I first heard that, I said, well, how's one got to do with the other, right? How is fasting going to help you're not married, right? What he meant was, if you fast, you will build self-restraint, and you need self-restraint if you're not married, right? So these, all the ibadah are a training mechanism that Allah is using to convert us from what we are to what He hopes we will become. The Sahaba radiallahu used not only the best teacher, but the, they were the best in ibadah to become who they were, random people in the desert, to the greatest civilization ever to exist. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let me ask a, a question. When is the most patience required during the fast? Who has any idea? During your fast, what, what point is the, is the most patience required? Alhamdulillah, on the first try. Exactly, on, when you are breaking the fast. Why is that? Because your, A, your hunger is at its peak, uh, but also because you're letting your guard down, right? It's one thing to block it out all day, stay busy, but now you're in front of the food. <coughs> Excuse me. I remember I was at a buffet once because it was a celebration. It was during Ramadan with two other Muslims for some issue we were celebrating. And one of the guys, he just went crazy on the first plate. And the rest of the meal, he said, I'm stuffed. I can't, I wish, I, what was wrong with me? I can't enjoy the rest of the meal, you know? That's an extreme example. But um, why is the sunnah to eat a little amount of food, then do the maghrib, and then have dinner? Because that's not what is culturally done in a lot of places. Some places they have a giant iftar that lasts until the end of Maghrib. Some places they have no, they don't even have an iftar. They just go rush quickly to Maghrib and then they have their dinner. Um, but the sunnah is, why is that? Well, A, there's a practical reason, right? You shouldn't be thinking about food in the Maghrib. And also you shouldn't be postponing eating. Um, I mean, you shouldn't be overeating either. 
But there's a cognitive reason that we don't think about, and that is that the most improvement in your patients will happen if you restrain yourself, not completely obviously, but you restrain your big desire when breaking the fast. So this is an extension of the concept of the reason I'm, I'm holding myself back from eating and drinking is not just to do that, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm purposefully making myself feel hungry and then, and then not obeying that impulse. So I build the skill of not obeying impulses. And that gets even harder at the time we're opening the fast. <clears throat> A, a, a way to think about this is Muhammad Ali is uh, famous for saying, they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? He said, I don't know, because I don't start counting until it hurts. And what that means is, you know, you do, and anytime you work out, whichever that exercise is, the first 80% of the workout is just to get you physiologically active. And all the benefits come in the last 10, 20, 15% like this. A lot of people, they work out some, and then when it gets hard, they say, okay, that's enough. But really, they didn't work out at all. Like, they got themselves into a metabolic state where they were about to benefit, and they stopped. But in that last part is really where the cha physiological change happens in your body. The first 80% of the workout is just to get you there. So the fast is very similar. You fast the whole day to get yourself really ready to eat so that you can break your fast in a calm way. And then improve a lot, just like when you're working out. You know, you, you, some people go to the gym and they, they don't get much benefit, right? And there are some people, they know everything about fitness and they come every week with new gains. Um, so how can we use this information to improve our, the benefits of fasting? That's the real takeaway, right? This has all just been the background information. So kind of like I was just saying, think of your fasting and really in my personal belief, think of all ibadah as exercise. Cognitive exercises to train our iman. I mean, the Sahaba radiallahu didn't magically become so amazing. Obviously, they had the greatest teacher, but there were probably people in that city who didn't become so amazing, right? Uh, they, they, uh, we, we know of the ones who became amazing, who one of them, you could throw them into China, and he is better than an entire army. They, they did that because they went through, you know, it's like if I worked out with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm probably going to get results. So if you're doing your Ibadah Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're getting a whole different form of workout. Um, purposefully pushing yourself to improve your Iman. If, just like if you go to the gym and you just walk for with five miles an hour on the treadmill for an hour, and you say, yeah, I did it, okay, great. And you go every day for years and you say, it's okay, I don't really get that much benefit. Sure, walking is on five miles an hour is better than nothing. It's not, you know, just like fasting is better than not fasting. But that's not the most efficient workout, right? They have all these schemes, you know, you do certain intervals and you do weights and you do all this stuff, right? If you get a really good workout, you can transform your whole body in four months. If you get the most of your ibadah, your iman can maybe shoot through the roof, perhaps. But it's also possible to be working out for years and really not make improvement, right? Um, so the key is, it sounds counterintuitive, Focusing on experiencing the unpleasant sensations you're going through during the fast. Right? When you work out, you are literally, we could say, harming your body. Or not harming your body. You are distressing yourself. You're lifting weights you can't lift. That's the point. If you only lift what you can already lift, you're only going to maintain your current physical fitness. You have to push yourself to the point where you can no longer pick this bar up. And in that last rep, is when your body changes. So purposefully experiencing hunger and thirst and finding a way to remain constant is when you will really improve your mind and, and, and indirectly in, in increase your iman. That's in opposition to avoiding the unpleasantness. That's kind of like the one who goes to the gym and he only just does a very simple workout and leaves. He doesn't want to sweat. He doesn't want to like, feel distressed. Uh, avoiding would be something like, and we're all guilty, I'm guilty of this as well, sleeping, right, things like this. It's not that I'm saying, oh, you shouldn't want to sleep, but it's just this idea of experiencing the distress of being hunger and, thirst and thirsty um, and finding a way through it is different from, you know, even if it involves distracting yourself, that's totally fine. There are many techniques. There's distracting yourself, 
Um, there is uh, uh, forms of ibadah that help you maintain your focus. Um, but avoiding it is the, the, the point. The point, if you, if you remember that the point of the fast is to go through that experience and succeed through it. If I avoid the experience, this is perhaps why we uh, know that uh, Rasulullah said, you, there will be some people who fast and they will gain nothing but hunger and thirst. What he means is, did you really benefit from it? So the question is, we never ask, well, how do you benefit from it or not? So it's my belief that at least partially, you can't, I can't say this is the whole, the whole thing, but a big part of it is what you gain from the experience. So uh, just a, a few examples. Uh, distracting yourself is a good way. It's something we teach, actually, when people have to deal with stressful situations. Um, distracting yourself is, a, because this is the same, any technique that you could use when you have to deal with another impulse later. Because that's the point. The point is this is a training exercise. I want to learn how to be hungry and thirsty voluntarily and just go on with my day. So that hopefully I can be angry and not act on that impulse. I can be depressed and maybe not act on that impulse. I can be lazy and tired and still wake up from my salah. These is all, those are the results of training myself. Um, so distracting yourself through unpleasant uh, sensations is a perfectly legitimate way that you could do that later on. Um, <clears throat> so for example, if you were angry, uh, it would be a good technique to just stay quiet because after a while, you'll probably calm down. You could come back to the person who you were talking about later, and you could go watch some, watch some television maybe, or anything like this. The point is, you wouldn't have had an outburst to the person. Then you will come back later. Uh, another thing is just to allow the sensations to uh, reduce on their own. This is a very common thing that it's difficult for people to remember. All the emotions we feel, they're temporary. Even though you're feeling hungry right now, is, you don't, usually don't feel like at this top level hunger all day long in the fast. There'll be times when you're feeling more hungry. But if you actually just get through it, it kind of reduces on its own, right? That's a good technique to practice because that's the same thing will happen with all the other negative impulses that you will have. So these are just things to keep in mind. Like you would say, well, how can I get better at fasting? You're telling me not to avoid it. You know, then I should just suffer. Not that you should suffer, but your mind will instinctively find ways to help you through those impulses. And doing that will really make the benefit. You know, you want to come out of Ramadan on Shawal first, more patient, uh, you know, more compassionate, more uh, uh, relaxed. So it's kind of like if I said I was going to the gym for 30 days, I came back and you said, you look the same. What were you doing in there, right? But if I come back and I can run faster, I can jump higher, you say you really benefited from it. Okay. That's the end of part one. Part one is what are the benefits of fasting? And in summary, is to train yourself to not act on impulses. But here's, here's the, how can we use that in addition? Um, uh, but then how can we use this to understand better why did Allah prescribe fasting in Ramadan? Okay? A'udhu billahi minishtan narajim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. So, O you have believed, decreed upon you is fasting, as it was decreed upon those before you, that you may develop taqwa. So a lot of times we ask like some, someone who, just random person, why do you fast? They will say, oh, maybe to be more grateful for the things you have or something like that. Um, which are good reasons, but that's not actually the reason Allah has told us. He told us it's to build taqwa, to build your fear of Allah or your mindfulness of the accountability you will have. So it's kind of a funny thing to say. How does not eating build taqwa? I used to ask myself this. I don't, I, someone told me this verse like 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> there was a Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran. And I told this person who knew Islam better than me, the purpose of fasting is to build self-restraint. He said, where did you get that? I said, it's in the Quran. And he said, he knew better than me. He said, he didn't want to be arrogant. He said, show it to me. So I showed him this verse in English. I didn't know any word of Arabic at this time. And he said, that's not what it says. I said, what does it say? He says, it's to build taqwa. I said, what is taqwa? And so he told me it's fearing God. I said, well, why did the translator write self-restraint? He said, I don't know. 
I've been thinking about this question for 20 years. I had to become a psychologist to figure it out. Inshallah, I don't know if I can say I figured it out, but. So if we roll it back, the purpose of fasting, one of the purposes of fasting, is to build delayed gratification, right? Jannah is the ultimate delayed gratification. We need to sacrifice now in anticipation of future reward. But that's difficult. And oftentimes, all of us, we eat the marshmallow. We do the thing we shouldn't do right now, or we don't do the thing we should do right now, because it's, it's hard to do everything correct in waiting for, for a long time of something you don't, you know, for us, maybe 80 years seems a long time, even though it's not. But to a four-year-old, 15 minutes seemed like a long time. And especially when you have shaitan constantly whispering in your ear, eat the marshmallow, eat the marshmallow. Essentially, that's what he's doing our whole life. He's trying to convince us not to delay our gratification. So in addition to building patience for our general life events, which fasting does, it also helps us patient, have patience for the suffering through this life to do good deeds without receiving the rewards to later. So fasting is experiencing hunger and thirst and voluntarily abstaining from acting on those desires, even though you have the capacity to. And taqwa is having the desire to sin and voluntarily abstaining uh, because you have a fear of your accountability to Allah. So taqwa isn't just something you have, we need to build it. And Allah is telling us you can build it through fasting. And the, but the connecting of the dots, how not eating gets you, to, gets you taqwa. Not eating builds your ability to be patient with your impulses and, and delay your gratification. And that skill is essentially another definition of taqwa. Delaying your current gratification for your whole life for something other people may be telling you is doesn't even exist. But you believe it exists and you're going to abstain from things that you should because you're waiting for a reward. You're going to do things you don't always want to because you're waiting for a reward later on. That's a skill that's, that's difficult. It's not so easy. And the key is um, it's important to fast in a way that will actually build that patience. We want to try, and I'm guilty of this as well, try to avoid, trying to avoid the experience of fasting, but just getting through it somehow, um, you know, it will still complete the obligation, but may not build as much taqwa. Like if your parents were making you go to the gym and you just did the minimum requirement because you were, you were required to go there. Uh, so in, an, you know, in summation, we want to try and not just fast so that we gain hunger and thirst, but think of it as like an opportunity to develop patience and eventually develop taqwa uh, by actually experiencing the unpleasant sensations of fasting, but trying to build techniques to deal with that, a variety of ways. But the more that I experience difficult things, just like the more I pick up some really heavy bar, my mind will come up with a lot of ways Everyone has, will find different ways of building that ability. And then inshallah, that ability can translate to a lot of other areas of our life. And that's why he's requiring us inshallah to do it at least a month every year. And then as many voluntarily times as we can. Uh, I think that's all. So bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Uh, sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa, wa alihi wa sahbihi ajmeen. Uh, if there are any questions, we can do that as well. And is there anyone with a microphone? <laughs> Normally, the imam is here and handles all of that. <laughs> I guess he will go grab one. How much time did I spend?
Great. Okay. Okay, that's a great question. The brother is saying, is this similar to people who suggest various techniques for stopping smoking, such as drinking water, taking a walk, this kind of thing. <clears throat> Technically, stopping smoking is a little bit more complicated. There is, we do do uh, therapy for that because there is a separate mechanism that is maintaining the smoking. So oftentimes something uh, like those techniques alone may not be sufficient for the entire stopping of smoking. I don't want to go on like a digression and, and discuss all of that. But in addition to the main thing we would talk to them about, which is called uh, replacing a negative reinforcer. But in addition, the, in, in the, the ways to deal with the, 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 the part that's similar is that during the experience of quitting smoking, one of the skills you need to learn is to deal with difficult impulses. <clears throat> so that part is where the overlap is. Because what happens is, let's imagine you have stress throughout the day and it's climbing. This is a graph I'm drawing and it's going up, it's going up, it's going up, right? Now if you don't smoke, you don't drink alcohol, you don't do any of this, right? Eventually you have to find some way to deal with this stress. Take a walk, talk to a friend, whatever, and it slowly goes down, right? And so it takes a while. So you have to learn patience with the time period it takes for it to slowly decrease, and you have to develop the skills to make it slowly decrease. But if somebody smokes, what they do is they take a magic pill, we'll call it, or a smoke, right? And it just drops immediately. They chemically force their brain to become relaxed. So they never learn the skills to de-stress themselves. And they don't have the patience for the fact that it won't be immediate. They can't just go, Oh, I'm relaxed immediately. No, it doesn't work that way, right? If you're really stressed and you take a walk, it'd take you half an hour to calm down. They don't have the patience built up and they don't have the skills. So that part is exactly identical. Anytime there's a difficult impulse or emotion you have to deal with, there are several coping strategies you can use. Um, <clears throat> and it's usually based on the person and the situation, but these are all great ones. Uh, physical things are really helpful for relaxing person, whether it's taking a walk or doing, each person has a different thing. Some people like to just take a stroll and see nature. Other people like to do these really hard workouts like CrossFit or something. People who do CrossFit, they tell me, the reason I do it is because I feel totally relaxed afterwards. All the stress has been drained out. I need to go to that maximum. CrossFit is like this very extreme workout. Um, taking a drink of water is a way of giving your mind an alternative physical sensation to the smoking one. So your, your, your question is really right on. In general, that, that, and this, this sort of proves the original thesis, that's, that fasting trains your ability to resist your impulses in other areas. Because he immediately thought of another area. If you can restrain yourself from smoking, uh, from, sorry, from eating and drinking, probably you have the ability, uh, ability to restrain yourself from smoking. Imagine someone who smoked, but also fasted very well for their whole life, from childhood to when they were older. And one day they decided they had to stop smoking. They'd probably be a lot more prepared to do it than someone who had never had any experience uh, uh, restraining themselves from their impulses. They would just, well, after two days, they always tell me, people tell me, I will use willpower, I don't need your advice. And I'll say, I'll see you in a week or two, you know? Willpower alone, how is that gonna get you there? Uh, but if you have trained your mind using these techniques, you can do lots of stuff. You can get through the difficulty um, of quitting smoking. You can do anger management a lot more easily. You can have patience if your business is failing. It's easy to tell someone, oh, have patience with, uh, have trust in Allah. Yeah, I'm having trust in Allah, but Jesus, every night I'm, ang I'm anxious. My family could lose everything, right? That's not an easy task. So these are all things that, inshallah, we're building the cognitive skill to do through fasting.
Alhamdulillah, it's a great question. Um, anyone else? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this you are saying is really also, I remember when I went to boot camp about nine weeks or 10 weeks, I have a friend, both of us were in boot camp. He smokes, I don't smoke. So for nine weeks, he was not smoking because you are not allowed to smoke. So when we are going for AI to we stop somewhere to get food, and he told me, hey, I want to go smoke. And I told him, you've been nine weeks, 10 weeks without smoking. Why are you going to start? He said, that's a good idea. <laughs> and he doesn't smoke anymore. Huh. No, that's a terrific example, I think. The brother was saying that he went nine or 10 weeks without smoking, uh, but still he had, he said, why don't I just start it up? He didn't even probably realize that I do have the cognitive skills to find another way to cope with anxiety. But now that I don't have to, Maybe it should just take the easy way out, right? I mean, inshallah, none, maybe none of you have drank before. Maybe some of you did in the past or so you would know this, but <clears throat> there are two reasons people drink alcohol. And I have to know which one the person is doing it for to know how to treat them. One is the positive benefits. They like to go have fun, party, and like they said, they drink some alcohol and they go have a party or something, right? The other one is as a negative reinforcer, which means it takes away their stress. So that's the person who goes to the bar every night and just nurses these beers. They have, or, or whatever, they stay at home and they have their scotch and they think, oh, look how cool I am. The reality is you have stress, you don't know how to deal with it. And you need a magic pill in the form of liquid, in the form of smoke, in the form of uh, stress eating, in the form of any substance that when you, induces your brain to magically take the stress away temporarily. And what Allah is saying, you can learn that skill on your own. And when you do, you can apply it not just to stress and whatever, like a psychologist talks about, you can apply it to the more important thing, which is getting through your life following the Sharia, leading to Jannah, which is not an easy task, right? <clears throat> um, which, as we said, is, is the ultimate delayed gratification. There are millions of marshmallows, and most of us are eating them all the time. We're just maybe eating a little less, but there's, each time we do it, is we've given up a little bit. You know, is this, this to trial today was too difficult kind of thing. Um, but Alhamdulillah is a great example. Um, I don't know if the sisters also need a microphone or if anyone else has anything. MashaAllah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> great question. Uh, he's asking what are some strategies a kid could use? to fast Ramadan. I can relate because I'm not sure, a lot of people here are not from the US. I was born and raised here. I was the only Muslim in the entire school. I was from a small town in the old days when there were barely any Muslims. So I had to go, not only I had to fast when I was your age, I had to go to the lunchroom and sit right with everybody. You know, my wife is from a Muslim country and I was like, do you know what it's like? And she came, she, when she came to America, she had to do the same, unfortunately. I had to go to, a, uh, what was it called, uh, track practice. Oh gosh, at that time, when I was a teenager, it was in the summer, uh, even the 90, 100 degree weather, and everyone was eating ice cubes. <laughs> and I was like, why am I on the track team? So it can be tough, it's tough for anybody. It's extra tough if you're a kid, because A, you're more new at it, and B, you might even be uh, facing difficulties that the adults aren't facing. <clears throat> So uh, first, obviously, is making dua to Allah to help us through all these things. I'm not suggesting that cognitive skills alone are, uh, are the answer. Um, but, I can even be, but I can be asking in, Allah for, in my dua to give me those cognitive skills as well. So one is, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned before, distraction is a legitimate, uh, in, so, in some cases, distraction is not good, right? But when you're dealing with a temporary impulse, it can be a very useful skill because it's good to remember that those impulses are temporary. So for example, you know, not throughout the whole day, it's not necessarily at its peak difficulty. There are certain times when I'm feeling more hungry or my friends have a bag of candy or if it's track practice or whatever, right? 
Honestly, maybe, it wasn't, maybe I wasn't even super thirsty until I saw everybody chugging the water. So the point is to remember uh, 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 one, either, either, either distraction at that time or just, the, or just the knowledge that whatever I'm feeling right now, I probably won't be feeling this in a half an hour. It's not like this horrible thing, I have to do something to get rid of it, as if it's permanent. Um, Alhamdulillah, you know, even the whole fast isn't permanent. You know, once I heard a lecture from someone who was in Palestine and he was telling us a long story and he was saying how when the, if, when the sunset came, there was no food. And there was this whole long story about this. The host kept telling him, oh, you're impatient, the food is coming. So they're, they're bringing the food. And after it became Isha time, he said, there's no iftar. And she said, in reality, there isn't anything I was hoping someone would bring. So our, even our fasts are actually temporary compared to whatever uh, some people are going through. So trying to remember that, <coughs> um, that's a little bit, you know, high level. So sometimes just simple things like distractions, you know, uh, whatever distractions the person has, going and hang, playing with their friends, going and talking about some random thing, going even and looking at comic books. You may say, well, aren't these a waste of time or something like that. Uh, but the point is, I'm doing something good and I want to keep doing something good. So as long as I'm not doing something like bad or haram, ways that I can uh, help encourage myself continue to, to, to do this thing, especially if I'm maybe younger than I'm even required to do it. It'd be great if I, if I start training ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, essentially, essentially any way that a person can either, there are, there are basically two methods. One is to learn to avoid those sensations and one is to learn to sort of power through them. But that's a little bit tougher for younger people. So that's why I usually recommend, you know, any kind of these distractions, uh, even if it's just something frivolous like, okay, I'm feeling really hungry, can me and so-and-so go play uh, basketball or something like that, right? Um, and instead of saying, well, you should be reading. Yeah, but if I'm reading, I'll probably just get more and more hungry. Uh, there's a time for reading, but it's good to remember the fast itself is, is already an exercise, is an ibadah, is maybe the most learning I'm going to get. Right, because I feel like we often talk about Qiyam al-Layl and Taravi and all these prayers during Ramadan and we kind of act like the fast is the fast. All you have to do is stop eating. Instead of saying like, I, I want you to get the most out of this fast. And whatever we need to do for you to benefit and come out at the end, even if you didn't do any extra prayer, you did your normal prayer. But in the end, you came out super patient because every time you felt hungry, you said, hey dad, I'm feeling hungry. I want to go do X, Y, Z so that I can, you know, I can get through it. That means I'm building the skill to recognize my own physical sensations and what's going on in my mind. That's called metacognition. The most, most, most important thing whenever somebody is a clinical psychologist, and in my view, the most important thing of just a human being is your metacognition, your insight into your own mind. Why do I think the way I think? There's, there's two rules in psychology. One is people have emotions, but they don't know why. And people ha act on emotions, but that they don't know they have. <laughs> That's essentially why they come to the therapist, right? People who aren't like that, who know what's going on in their mind, know why they're acting the way they are, this, is, this is, can really be a ticket to Jannah. So if all you, all you do is get through the month of Ramadan, and you, all you did was notice every time you were hungry, and ask your dad, can we do X, Y, Z? That means you've built the skill to be monitoring your physical sensations, monitoring your mind. So maybe next time he gets angry, he'll say, Daddy, you know what, I'm feeling really uh, frustrated. Can we go do X, Y, Z so I don't get upset? Wouldn't it be great instead of just having a kid act out or having an adult act out, you know? So it's just good to remember the quality of the fast in itself is a great skill to be working on. It's not just, oh, you did it, now go do extra stuff. So I hope that was, <laughs> hope that was useful. Jazakallah khair for the lecture. Um, I look around the room and I see that um, there's a bunch of uh, elders and old people. <laughs> and um, I see the talk that you're giving. And Milal, protect our young brother that asked that question. I think it may be life changing. So, inshallah, uh, we hope the administration will and the youth committee will make an arrangement that maybe you can uh, help us address the, the, the preteens and the teenagers, 
both sisters and brothers. Um, and if we have such a home, maybe we can encourage them to come to this lecture because I have a feeling that um, we are listening to your lecture and we mostly kind of reflect them back. <laughs> so they are young, they are, you know, most of it may actually be life changing for their lives going forward. So that's just my comment. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, it's a great comment. The brother was just saying, you know, if we can give this type of material for the youth more, I think it's great. We could definitely do it. I'm sure they already have, they have already several youth programs and sometimes more youth are here and I'd be glad to talk to anyone. <clears throat> but at the same time, I would say, you know, it almost sounded like, not that, so we definitely want to talk to youth as well, but it sounded like the brother was saying, you know, well, we're at the end of our life now. They need, they need the training, uh, you know, but I'll be honest, like we all need the training every day because you could do a lot of this training when you are young and then you get married and you get a job and it just like your, your physical fitness goes up and down every year, right? Based on how much you're working out. A few years ago, you were in shape, great shape. Now you're not, then you might get in better shape, right? Your Iman is the same way. You might be at the top of your game, a hafiz and everything else when you're 18. And then I talk to you when you're 15. He says, I don't know what happened. I got three kids, I got all these responsibilities and I barely make the fraud or like this. So honestly, um, you know, it's, it's not, not just I'm saying, oh, we all need it, but it's more like we all need it all the time, up until like the last day, because even we know that obviously the, what you die in is the most important thing. So I think it's a great idea, definitely. But I think it's a better idea like to have them come and be like, not only am I telling you this, you should continue to come to these lectures when you're 80. <laughs> kind of thing. At least that's my view because I know my own Iman and my own practice has changed throughout life. And every week I'm like, geez, what did I not do as good this week as I did the last week and how can I, can I, can I fix this? I agree with him for the kids. But I personally today you know, sometimes you know things and you don't know where to put them, like you said. You talk because you gave us the first lecture. Because I always watch people go to the mosque and do everything, but then outside, they're doing so much wrong. And you fill that gap. If, you, if it doesn't go to different stages in your life, that you're not developing the taqwa that you need. Hmm. And then um, my brother said about the teens, great, they really need to be here. But also, we need to be reminded because Life is that graph that goes up and down. And I personally benefit from this and I enjoy having you here. So I would love to see you again and again. Um, Thank you. I will, inshallah, I will continue talking because the main reason I have written this and given the talk is for my own reminder. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. I just wanna, if you can help us of how to be self-disciplined in terms of if I want to do something continuously, continu continuously without stop, in terms of fasting Thursday, I mean Monday and Thursday, maintaining prayer, and so forth and so on, how we can help ourselves to dis uh, self discipline or continuously doing so something? I mean, it's a great question. The brother was asking basically how to be, how to build self discipline. That's what we should we think of it: building it versus just be self disciplined. How we can create the skill of self-discipline so that we can be persistent in our ibadah or any other good thing? <clears throat> this is a great um, question. Uh, I usually try to inform my clinical practice with the guidance Allah has already given us because of all the teachers I had in my psychology doctorate program, none of them are as good as my main teacher. So, and my personal view of Islam is that it's basically a a full psychological lesson for the human being. That's like my view on it. Uh, so uh, the sunnah of the family of Rasulullah was not to do any good thing unless they did it consistently, even if it's small. This is one hadith. And it's really, really important because you will see every time in life we get, again, it's acting on impulses. We get excited about something. I'm going to go protest, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to pray all night long, right? This is just me acting on impulses. And of course, after two days, you know in January, all the gym memberships, the gyms make all their money in January, right? And then by March, they're empty again. 
right? And uh, Imam Hijazi was saying the same thing today in the khutbah about the Tarawih prayers and the first night it's filled and on the first night of the last 10 days it's filled, etc, etc. Um, <clears throat> so it's not that, and people usually say, oh, well, it's better than nothing. I would say it's not better than nothing because it just means that you can jump at your impulses and maybe shaitan even encouraged you, yeah, yeah, go crazy because he knows that will gas you out as they say in running. So it's better to say, okay, I'm going to hold back pur purposefully and I'm going to commit to some small thing and then make sure I do it. Instead of like my buddy who wants to show off and say, no, no, I'm going to be a superman and then after four days he'll say, oh, it wasn't my fault, I did what I could do. So already Rasulullah is teaching us that. And that's already been taught to us by Allah because if we really just follow the uh, system of Islam Allah has given us, that's built in. Right? He didn't say fast the whole year round. He said, okay, one month out of 12, you should do this. And if you can, throw in some extras. He said, these are the five times of the day you should pray. And, pray. and even in those five, the fard ones are really just the minimum. Make sure you do those. If you can do those, do some of the sunnah at those five times. Then if you want to try and do some extra consistently, maybe add in two rakah before the Adhan of Fajr or something like this, right? But the point is, the, the way Islam is structured already has that built in. Our talks are more like how to get the most out of those. But really Rasulullah used to discourage you know, people who would try and uh, do more in the way of changing the religion. Obviously the Sahaba were doing a lot of prayer at night, etc. But they had gradually worked up to that point where that's a consistent action for them. Not something I feel, you know, uh, oftentimes you will hear people in the end of Ramadan say, yes, let's make sure we keep coming to the masjid every night. It was great that you were all excited, but after one day or two days they didn't come back. So I mean, uh, uh, the, I, the, the one who's coming every night has built up to that gra consistently and gradual like that. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's almost a form of ikhlas, a form of sincerity. I don't want to just act on my desires right now, which happen to be good desires to want to do something great. I want to come up with a plan that I will stick to. You know, same, this happens a lot with diets. People come to psychologists for weight loss as well because they don't understand that quitting smoking and weight loss are mental issues. Technically smoking is a phys physiological addiction, but we have patches now to solve that, right? So the remaining part is really the psychological aspect. And eating behaviors are mostly psychological. But people don't usually want to talk, they want to talk about which food you eat, which diet, is it the keto, is it this thing, right? They don't want to talk about the, let's form a plan. Uh, uh, when, you, when we say diet, we don't mean like go on a diet like restricted calories, but let's find a diet meaning the foods you eat that are healthy, but also you enjoy, so it will be a long-term thing you will do for the next 30 years, and that diet will be one in which you've lost weight. Versus, I, need to, I have a wedding in two months. Can I eat grapefruit for the next week only? Right? And so really it's the same approach for our ibadah. <coughs> I think Allah would be very, he would be more happy if every Friday for the rest of your life you give a small sadaqah, and if, you know, every night or every morning before the Fajr Adhan, you just did two rakah extra. Um, versus, you know, like, I prayed Qiyam al-Layl for one hour twice last year, or something like that, you know? Uh, and so it's just that, just that mentality will really build, uh, not only, uh, so the idea is to have the consistency in mind, and don't be afraid to scale things back, because it's only about the intention. If you, you, you could give a million dollars. I mean, Allah doesn't need our money. It's not about, you know, imagine this. Let's imagine I give $10 every Jummah for the entire year. There's 52 Jummahs. So what is that? $520. Couldn't I just give all the $520 once? It's the same amount of money. But I've only done, I've only thought about helping people once then. Right? So Allah doesn't need my $520. He, if He wants those people, the, the people I give it to, He will get them their money no matter what. I'm not giving them any money, right? I have the opportunity to earn hasanah through sadaqah. If, if I don't give it, He'll make sure that those people get the money they're owed. It's how many times did I want to give a sadaqah, regardless of what the amount was. So it's just, it's the mentality that people have 
which often determines how consistent they can be. And almost always inconsistency is associated with acting on impulses. It's just sometimes they're a positive impulse that runs out. <laughs> so, <laughs> alhamdulillah, <laughs> go ahead. Lifting weights until um, someone comes. This is a terrific question. Um, <clears throat> he's asking how can someone, you know, keep focused on their ibadah, like fasting, uh, even when no one is looking. And it sounds funny, but you know, you can extend this, right? This is an overall question about sincerity <clears throat> and about the quality of something. Because maybe most of you adults, you say, I don't eat, I know Allah is watching me, right? Uh, but we do other things. We'll take a nap, right? We'll rush through our prayer at some points, right? We'll be half, half not paying attention. It's really an extension of the same question, right? How can we keep the quality of our ibadah as high as possible? And it, I'm really going to give the same answer because I'm going to say as consistently as possible. How can we do things to the best of our ability consistently? Um, and I think keeping in mind what is the reason I'm doing something is the key to that, to having that consistency. Um, you know, uh, I've actually heard people who give up something for, I think, Lent or don't eat during Lent or whatever when I'm in the workplace. And one time someone even said, like, I give up chalk. And he's like, well, I could eat chalk and no one would know. <laughs> and the person next to him, I saw her eyes wide up. Like, she says, God would know. You know, it was just, it was just the way he said it. <clears throat> it kind of tells you, though, then why is he even participating in the Lent, right? Am I participating? I'm sure in Muslim countries, probably this pressure, you know, one of the blessings of living here, I've had a lot of difficulties growing up here, but also no one was encouraging me to do anything in Islam. So it's, I, I have had less, very few dangers of lack of sincerity because no one was encouraging me. I'm sure in other countries, everyone is watching you what you do, right? So there probably are people who don't want to fast <laughs> and are probably eating or drinking when no one is watching. Or they're just, I'm going to get through this, whatever. I stay, I'll, I'll stay up all night long. I was in Egypt and I was like, everyone is awake at 2 in the morning and everything. Um, so the key, again, the key to consistently doing some ibadah with sincerity, which will help you, uh, like you said, do your exercise even, right? Is why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Not why am I being forced to do this? You know, if I go to the gym because I'm in gym class and the teacher's telling me, obviously I'll just pick up the bar with the lowest weight and do this because he said you have to do 20 reps. Okay, I'll just do 20 like this, right? So if I'm only fasting because I'm raised in a Muslim family, um, this actually comes up, this is actually a very good question because honestly one of the consultations I get from parents is how do I get my kids to care about Islam? It's very common. And sometimes they're asking me and the kids are 30. So it's not just when they're kids, it's very common. Um, <clears throat> because parents often confuse uh, conformity, I, how can I force my kids to do what I want, with internalizing something. How can they want to do the thing? When they're younger, you can make them fast. You can make them do whatever you want. So why, you, but then you're surprised when they have their own independence and they don't want to do the thing anymore. So it's difficult for parents to learn how to teach kids to learn about something like Islam, internalize it, and then have their own motivation. So that's really what you're asking about. Um, and the only way to do that is to build your own motivation. If you're doing something because someone else told you, you're not going to do it when they're not telling you, <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, even if it's something small, um, you know, uh, sometimes we think, well, well, the kids, they can't reflect on this. They have to fast and they have to pray because we told them to. That's not true. I've had conversations with six-year-olds, and they've asked about death and life and the akhirah. And actually, uh, sometimes adults, they say, how can a six-year-old understand about I said, they understand very well. It's when they become old like you, they will have all of these anxieties and hang-ups talking about it. But right now, they don't have those. They just come and ask me. So they can understand and have their own personal motivations. And so when someone is going to the gym because they want to be healthy, 
or they want to have a, a, a strong physique. I mean, Rasulullah told us that the strong believer is better and more loved to Allah than the weak believer, but they both have good in them. Of course, strong can have different meanings. But um, <clears throat> then they have their own desire to want to accomplish the thing. And then they will use what we said before, let me make my own plan to do something small and consistent. So basically the enemy is acting on my desire and doing something big that will fizzle out and doing it because someone else told me. <laughs> Those are not strategies for success. But doing things small and consistent because I know my own reason. If you have, and maybe with time things change, if you've forgotten why you're fasting, it's not a bad idea to sit down and think about it, to be honest. Maybe it's been so many years you just fast because, I don't know, that's prescribed by Allah, and if I don't do it, I won't go to Jannah. I mean, that's not a, the worst reason, but it's not the best reason. I don't, I'm pretty sure that's not what the Sahaba would have told us. That, I'm not saying there's one, anhu. I'm not saying there's one reason. There could be multiple good reasons, but that doesn't sound like a great one. <laughs> so, uh, I know it's late. I don't want us to go on too long. Do, I should just check if there's, if there's any questions from the sisters before we close up. I don't know if somebody... Nothing? Okay. How about this? If you have another one, you can ask me after we finish, because I, I have to pe half of a half. Also, old people were asleep already. <laughs> okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala sahbihi wa alihi ajmain. Amen.